Hello, welcome. We have a few more people just getting into their seats. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to remind you, inside the auditorium, we'll ask you to make sure that your phones are on silent. If you haven't already done that, I always have to remember mine. Um, it's a good reminder for you guys. I want to welcome you to the evening. Thank you for coming. Uh, I want to tell you that this is the Pecha Kucha night. Uh, I want to thank my colleague, Olivia Mangini, who's worked very hard to put this together. And I'm doing it up front just so I make sure that I get that out there. It's her first time putting together one of these evenings. And um, it's just my pleasure to have watched her work with the artists. Thank you. Um, welcome to Pecha Kucha Night, Hamptons, volume 34. Can you believe we've had 30, this will be our 34th Pecha Kucha Night. And from what I understand, we have never repeated an artist in all of those years. So it's wonderful to have everybody here. My name is Cherie Calderoni. I am the Director of Membership and Visitor Experience here at the Parish Art Museum. I would like to thank our eight creatives for joining us tonight as presenters. I'm sure many of you are here to support them. Thank you very much. For those who are unfamiliar with Pecha Kucha, you might want to say it now under your breath, Pecha Kucha, it's kind of fun. Um, it is an international organization founded in 2003 by Astrid Klein and Mark Ditham and features six minute and 40 second presentations while each image changes every 20 seconds. So there's a lot of routine, it's like going to step class. Pecha Kucha is the Japanese sound for chit chat. In addition to our own Pecha Kucha Night Hamptons, Pecha Kucha Night is also taking place in Hexter, UK, Panjim, India, and Nishinomaya, Japan. So, but you're here and we're happy you're here tonight. Um, so let's get started. To kick off this evening's visual, visual presentations, allow me to introduce photographer and artist, Tom Kochi. <laughs> Tom is a freelance photographer and artist who's been shooting primarily in the Hamptons since the 1990s. He's photographed performance, dance, social, and art events for various publications, theater companies, and cultural institutions, including the Watermill Center and the Parish Art Museum, as well as pursuing his personal work. Welcome, Tom. Come on up. Last time I had a microphone in front of me, I started off with Jumpin' Jack Flash, but we're not going to do that tonight. <laughs> I have a storied history. All right, here we go. I hope I can keep up. Back in my days at Pratt, besides a lot of street shooting, lower right, I photographed that magical bean in the upper left. 17 months later, I shot our daughter's debut photo below that. Then 10 years later, that shot of her and her daughter. For many years, I designed window displays, upper right, and followed Pat's inspiration and created artist dolls. That's our piece in the center. Around 20 years ago, I began doing production photos for Michael Disher, and since then, have, had a sh have shot for a number of theater companies and director. I most often shoot dress rehearsals so I can move around and hone my ability to recognize and instantly capture moments, sometimes dramatic, sometimes quiet and emotionally expressive. I've also photographed hundreds of musical performances in the ensuing years. The shot on the left I love because it captures this young lady being inspired by the hip hop fusion of soul and scribe at the Sag Harbor Music Festival. And the other is the dynamic performer, Don Ed Darden of the Hoodoo Loungers singing, I put a spell on you. I've also photographed at the Watermill Center and have a number of shots featured in the book, the, uh, the Watermill Center, a laboratory for performance. The young ladies with the cookies are from my first visit there, my Brazilian pen pals, Bomb Bomb and Tatiana. The dancer with the chair is Elka Leuten, who appeared in and choreographed David Bowie's last two videos. I photograph multiple art events and openings for museums, galleries, and fairs, as well as publication. The top left is an attempt at my request by photographer Ralph Gibson and Eric, artist Eric Fischel to censor some full front of nudity in his paintings for a possible publication. Uh, let's see. Uh, 
For a number of years pre-pandemic, I was privileged to document the annual East End studio tours for the New York Foundation of the Arts. Pictured here are April Gornick, John Toriano, Steve Miller, Ross Bleckner, and the late Eric Freeman. And of course, here's some people you might recognize, as I call that gallery on my website. I've always um, tried to avoid just the standard deer in the headlight shots when shooting celebrities. I can't even count how many society and chariot events I've, as well as parties and celebrations I've covered in the Hamptons. I suppose you could say I've captured some of the best dressed and the best undressed Hamptons partiers. <laughs> I have to say I'm heartened by all the compassionate and empathetic souls who've showed up to protest all the hatred, prejudice, injustice, dehumanization, and discrimination in the world, as well as the frightening march towards fascism and authoritarianism in this country. Pictured here are the, is the prescient New York City Women's March. Although most of my focus on people, every so often I capture some images from nature. Here's two contrasting shots. First, an idyllic scene I shot in Bridgehampton while driving Steve Miller home after a luncheon after the NYFA studio tour. The other is Cooper's Beach after Hurricane Sandy. A bit of departure is a preface to my other creations. For as long as I can remember, I've been obsessed with the beauty and expressiveness of the human figure. I've done drawing as well as working in three dimensions. The first piece, along with one of my wife Pat's pieces, was in a Millennium Doll Art exhibit at a museum in Tokyo. Uh, these are images are of the Colombian dance company El Colegio del Cuerpo. I first met when they performed here at the parish to songs of Leonard Cohen. The top left photo is from that. The middle shot is from Negra Anger, a piece dealing with racism set to the music of Nina Simone. I've always loved how, beautif how beautifully Crystal articulated her body while dancing. She never modeled nude before, but I asked her if she might consider it, and she decided we would both grow as artists from the experience. She wrote this after our very first shoot. Anyone is lucky to have someone as patient as you and is able to make someone feel at ease and completely themselves. Your work is art in the process as well as the final product. You help people find themselves through your photography. This piece was for the Birdhouse Auction, a fundraiser, a three-dimensional piece. And my wife's piece in the original slide was that was from that. Collaboration again. After our first shoot at the beach, Erica messaged me that she wanted to uh, shoot again and suggested we shoot in the woods, sort of as a gothic wood nymph, exactly what I was going to suggest. She posed fearlessly with sheer black fabrics, as well as her body wrapped in vines as, with, as, one, as if one with the surrounding nature. Each of these collaborators bring their own unique spirit to the process. Here's some incidental portraits captured in the moment. If I had to title them, perhaps Innocence, Serenity, Confidence, and Intensity. I, I don't direct a shoot, but I provide props for the models to improvise with. For the shot on the right, I provided Edna with several yards of sheer fabric. I shot continuously as she improvised a uh, mesmerizing dance. Uh, she wound up with her body swathed in the fabric, and I captured this ethereal, ethereal stillness that I titled Spirit. I love shooting by the bay and the ocean. The fully one reminiscent of Ophelia was during a fashion shoot for a friend's uh, daughter. I'm going to go on to the next one. Uh, I'd email Crystal this shot, Breeze, and she answered back, Tom, that's why we understand each other and work so well together. A simple concept, but so complex at the same time. That stroke of artistic genius, those aha moments most people don't understand. The moments of basic action, such as rotating the picture or simply having your dancers face a different direction, are the hardest, but the most rewarding revelations come by Bravo. Here's a shot of my website homepage if you want to follow, you know, more, see a lot more of what I've done over the years. Um, I realized, my daughter wrote this to me, I have to end with this. 
Uh, she posted this on her Instagram. She's an incredible photographer, Shonda Hall. I realized recently that one of my biggest photography influences has been my dad. I wanted to thank him for giving me an appreciation for small moments and for showing me how to be open to the world and the people in it. People tell stories and can make people feel seen, and you taught me that. It's like the best compliment I could get. Thank you. That was great. Let's give Tom a hand for uh, being the first one. And I've, I've seen Tom here at the parish at various events, and I really had no clue as to the breadth of your work. So it was so exciting to see the contrast of colors and light and dark and color and not color. It was just lovely. Um, I neglected earlier to uh, tell you that uh, our Friday nights, all of our Friday nights, are made possible in part by our presenting sponsor, Bank of America, with additional support by the Conquering Group and Sandy and Stephen Pearlbinder. We thank them very much. And our next presenter is Megan Booty. Uh, Megan Booty's work revolves around themes of personal transformation. She is most interested in the process of change and how it relates to herself and the viewer. In her photographs, sculptures, and performances, she crafts descriptive tales, inviting viewers to explore the outer reaches of personal possibility. She has frequented Brid Bridgehampton throughout her life and currently lives and works in South Hold, New York. Please welcome Megan. Hello, everybody. Thanks so much for coming. Welcome to the magic of the universe. Come on over and step inside. My work tells stories about change. How does a beggar girl become a queen? How do you get into the cocoon and how do you get out? Why do I care? Because I want to change so badly. Since 89, I've been making art about the hero's journey. Here I will be pairing my images with sound, all the better to activate. All the better to activate our spirits, my dear listeners, all the better to open the door of our psyches to the grand adventure. So what stops us? What stops me from changing? That's easy fear. And us humans have a whole lot of fear piled on from past trauma. So how can art help? Wouldn't it be amazing if an image could heal? What if art offered an immersive experience that went right to the heart of where it hurt most and then offered a new narrative in response? But for this to work, you've got to live the image. You've got to be in the image. So. How do you get in? Simply unlock your mind and let the piece take you. Could all art be a portal to somewhere else? Could change be about asking questions? Consider this my invitation to you. I am rolling out the red carpet. Come on inside. So let's get down to business. Let's start at the very beginning. A very good place to start. Often the journey starts with a crisis that forces us out of our comfort zone. And suddenly, we, a reality reinvents itself as we are groping, for dark, groping in the darkness. And miraculously, the unspeakable tragedy leads you to a shining oasis. Walls of the past tumble down, and you find yourself adapting to survive, and this adaptation Bread of suffering develops superpowers. And that's a good thing, since you're going to need them. You just might find yourself dancing with a handsome devil underground that tramples on your softest parts. Whether it's the beast within or the beast without, sooner or later, you're going to have to tangle with him. The beast comes on soft and smooth. And before you know it, you're locked in an embrace with Mr. Wonderful. 
It feels so nice. Well, actually, it's a little bit squishy and kind of uncomfortable here in this beast of a belly. At least I don't have to worry about me. Uh, excuse me, why am I chained? As much as I like headdresses, eyes wide shut isn't sexy anymore. And being authentic is sexy suddenly. If you dare to save yourself, be yourself. The last big question, can I stop caring if people like me? So no matter how hard we try, we sometimes still fall into the booby trap. And then we just can't take it anymore and drink the Kool-Aid. I have become comfortably numb. There's something to be said for hitting rock bottom, because then there's nothing to care so much about. Did you know that a caterpillar turns to mush inside its cocoon before becoming a butterfly? So give your mind a vacation and surrender to the mushy time. That's not often easy. Sometimes there are no words in the face of the enormity, and even and especially in mourning, people stand strong and rally in mission. As Rena Maria Rilke said, life is a mission. When you do find your mission, hang on for dear life because it will claim you and nothing else will compute. Somehow that mission will always lead you back to community and that power of community as it gathers will develop another superpower, bread of initiation. Stepping into our full power will always involve our relationship with the natural world. Like the tides, we are either expanding or contracting in every given moment. Choosing growth again and again will lead to nothing less than a sea change. It's time to pack your bags and head for the wild blue yonder. After all the hardship, something new is born. Something very young, almost fe fetal, that will shrivel up and die if you don't care of it. Take care of it now. I am just seven hours old. Truly beautiful to behold. <laughs> And the grand adventure exists in our backyards where we can kick ass in our daily lives. Change is as simple and as difficult as learning something new in the face of challenge. Every moment offers the chance to take one giant leap forward. Then, after many such steps, we arrive and someone says again, come inside. In the velvet darkness, of the blackest night, burning bright, there's a guiding star. I find this really scary, but can I just adore myself for a moment? Try it, right now. How often do we unabashedly feel good about ourselves? Does it, does change depend on us flexing this underused muscle every day? every hour. Ultimately, it's about coming home and playing house, or just playing inside oneself. It's about finding the kernel of love that cuddles our regret and shame in a warm blanket as we relax before the fire. Everything is perfect right now. <laughs> Wow. That was delightful, Megan. I didn't know if I was taking a trip back or if I was being propelled forward. I mean, it, unbelievable. Thank you. Um, OK, our next presenter, Adam Lowenbein, artist. Adam Lowenbein is a painter who lives and works on the east end of Long Island in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. He has a BFA in painting from Rhode Island School of Design and an MFA in painting from Indiana University. He is an alumnus of the Skohegan School of Painting and Sculpture and spent a year as a core fellow at the Glassell School Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. His paintings have been exhibited nationally in New York City, Houston, Texas, South Florida, and locally at the Marquis Projects in Bellport, New York. Welcome, Adam.
Hello. Uh, thanks so much to the Parish Museum for inviting me tonight, and thank you all for coming. From the start, I've been interested in placing people into visual situations that could describe layers, interior and exterior, theatrical spaces that can hint at what lies underneath. This first painting was, is an early one done in 1986. When I was a kid, my dad was an illustrator and my family would pose for the characters in his work. I loved knowing that what other people saw in these images was fake and that it was me in those pictures. This painting is from a series of selfie photos that I painted on. Here I become Elizabeth Taylor as Cleopatra in front of a Titian painting, layering art history, Hollywood, and drag. Around the same time, I was also making large studio-sized installations that I could literally put myself in. I was using my own body in a kind of pretend performance. Swimming was a vehicle for being above and below the metaphorical surface. I'm a total daydreamer. I created this robe from squares of felt that I poured colored dyes onto so that they were little Rorschach tests. I love to combine found materials and objects with painted surfaces to create a kind of three-dimensional painting. I was obsessed with magic as a kid. I collected magic tricks and put on magic shows. I loved using illusion and making one thing seem like another. This installation is built out of many small collaged paintings, each depicting a mini me running around inside little painted interconnected worlds. In the past five years, I've returned to mostly painting on canvas. This one combines multiple surfaces and fabric sleeves to build a kind of figure with a landscape and other figures inside it. It is male and female and both. For a gay person, these descriptions often blur. When I was a teenager, I performed in theater productions. I was seduced by the, la the layers of illusion. It still resonates with me, actors and costumes, two worlds overlapping. This is a painting of a Victorian man in drag, also multiple things at once, male and female, reality and dress up, again, overlapping. I paint things in places that are in the world around me and try to capture the murkier unknownness of them. I'm particularly interested in the point at which these two consciousnesses meet, the edge between thinking and dreaming, between awakeness and sleep. When COVID hit, I instinctively turned to my work as a record of my days. I've tried to harness the eeriness of life as it is now, flipped inside out for literally all of us. During the lockdown, I found imagery to try to describe the isolation. I love painting glass and reflective surfaces where multiple layers of reflective light can literally represent both what is on the surface and what lies beneath. I love to depict deep illusionary space and volume and also to prevent it with flatness. Five years ago, I began working part of the year in South Florida. I'm drawn to the alchemy of the incandescent light and dense atmosphere of the humid air. This is part of a series of nocturnal paintings. It's hard not to see symbols in most everything around me right now, and I try to infuse the paintings with crazy, saturated color, overlaid with the darker sense of foreboding I feel. At night, everything seems to take on a new form. I love to capture a gesture and a mood and setting and try to make it feel like the moment is being stretched out. Something dramatic may happen or nothing at all. I love to use the illusion of lighting from a TV or a cell phone or a swimming pool at night to capture a moment lost in thought or reverie. A conceptual idea can also be a great way for me to explore a particular color. I know that I've gotten lost down the deep blue glowing wormhole of doom scrolling late at night, and the blue can saturate everything around me. In this way, I can use color as a kind of character in my work. 
I also particularly love the disjointedness of Florida at Christmas time, where the hot, humid landscape is festooned with lurid, glowing neon light, a true winter wonderland of eerie splendor. These days, the landscape seems so much more fraught and vulnerable. The swampy landscape seems ready to swallow everything back. I see this gas station from my studio window, and I'm always struck by how beautiful and melancholy it looks under the massive sky. My initial spark to tell a story, to reveal a situation, to show an image that can trigger an emotion has stayed with me. I'm always looking to amplify the abstraction in the scenes around me. What seems boring can foreshadow something richer and fuller. Painting allows me to draw from my life and create a parallel world with it. It is the opposite of social media. Instead of making bright, sunny pictures that try to present a successful life, I'm looking to reveal the uncomfortable and express the deeper layers and hidden things. Reality seems split in half in the world right now. People looking at the same information and coming up with opposite opinions and ignoring danger. With painting, I can describe these extremes, hot and cold, orange and blue. I love painting. When I start a new image, I work broadly and with unrestrained color. It's a process I can disappear into, finding the form and honing it out of the marks and blocks of paint. For me, it's the process that most closely mirrors being in the world and finding meaning. Thank you so much for looking. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you can see more of my work at my website, adamlowenbein.com, or look for me on Instagram. Thank you. Adam's not getting off that easy. I'll be in touch about a studio visit very soon. <laughs> um, thank you, Adam. That was just really wonderful. Uh, our next creative is Cynthia Daniels. You'll notice we're moving around on the uh, program there a little bit. Cynthia Daniels is a recording engineer and recording producer. Cynthia is the owner and chief engineer of the East End's only world-class recording studio, Monk Music Studios. She produces, records, and mixes music for fe feature and independent films, books, and podcasts. Cynthia has hosted and engineered sessions for high-profile artists and networks, including Beyonce, <laughs> Jay-Z, Paul McCartney, Alec Baldwin, Jimmy Fallon, Scarlett Johansson, Sarah Jessica Parker, PBS, NPR, ABC, NBC, Paramount, Disney, and Universal. <laughs> Cynthia, please come on up. Hello. Thank you so much to the artists and to the Parish Museum for hosting what's already such a beautiful event. They say, or we used to say in the 70s, that um, talking about music is like dancing about architecture. But I will attempt. I work in a place called the control room in a recording studio. And I'm the only one there who does exactly what I do, which is to steer the ship of a recording session. In this role, I'm one-third musician, one-third technician, and one-third politician. Sometimes I feel I need to be a magician. This is a mixing board we call a console, and it's how we record the instruments and voice for a song, a whole album, or film project. Afterwards, I mix the project. Some people say it's like the cockpit or surgery theater, but audio arts and sciences are a lot less complex than, say, an operating room or an airplane. And when the chips are down, emergencies arise, and no one's life is on the line, I'm glad I wield a tape machine, now replaced by computer parts, not a knife or a flying machine. In recording, I choose the right microphone for the instrument or the voice in order to contour the sound in the best way possible. I decide the room layout where the musicians will stand or sit, 
get a balance of the mics for the headphone mixes for everyone so they can hear themselves or the other musicians and the other musicians properly. Sometimes I put up several vintage mics and choose which sounds better later. I try to keep technology out of the way so the artists can focus on their part of the process. My job is to maintain the flow of the session so they can be inspired. They have their own fears of committing their music into permanent record, and the clock is ticking, and time is also money, so being prepared is key for everyone involved. When I first started my career in the 70s, I was in college in Boston and doing live sound for punk bands at local clubs. I got a PA system for graduation the way some people get a car. I dragged these giant speakers around for months until they finally blew out from the extreme power required by those crazy bands. I moved to New York City, started at the bottom of the ladder at a really big studio and crawled my way up. A few years later, I was engineering 16 hours a day, recording everything I could, dance music, small ensembles, jingles, which had huge budgets, and TV and film scores, lots and lots of jazz. As my career grew, I began to record cast albums for Broadway and 60-piece orchestras for film and TV. At one point, I was mixing music for four daytime dramas, about 20 game show themes, network news themes, a highlight was getting to re-record the wide world of sports theme. A lot of the Broadway shows that were being revived were the music of my fondest childhood memories. I was working at the largest rooms in the city, the hit factory, the power station. I got to record and mix the Fantastics, Kiss Me Kate, The Music Man, Little Shop of Horrors, and The Producers. I was also recording live concerts, Barbara Cook at Carnegie Hall and The Met, Elaine Stritch at the Public, Jazz at the Blue Note. Most of these shows require the venue, require complex setups involving remote recording trucks outside the venue with impossibly long cable lines tying into the hall sound systems. It requires a lot of planning. And after another 20 years of commuting for work in the city, watching the big orchestral rooms give way to more lucrative businesses like high rise condos, I decided it was time to start building my own recording studio. It's an acoustically perfect space now, designed with lots of windows and large thick double glass sliding doors to let in as much light and greenery as possible. I built it and they did come. Now I'm able to work just a few feet from my home and keep my noisy career contained from my neighbors and my partner and continue to live my dream. We basically run three types of sessions, recording, mixing music and film, voice only, and looping. Looping is called ADR, or automated dialogue replacement. They're really specialized sessions in that there are places where the dialogue in a TV show or movie is compromised. The actor has to come into the studio, watch the scene, try to lip sync their lines with the same emotion and intention as they had at the time of filming. And as you can imagine, not everybody likes to do it. We connect with LA or London or New York where the director is and control their picture from our studio via time code. We also connect via Zoom these days. It's complicated, but safe. Sometimes I actually stare at the talent. Of course, we record so much music. Sorry, we record books and podcasts and lots of animation. This is voice-only work with pictures of the actor's character spread around the room so they can be inspired by who they actually look like. We have to film them at the same time so their lips and expressions can be recorded to inspire the animators. Five seconds of animation takes at least a week to complete. You may know these people. And of course, we record so much music that my photo montage would fill a book. Paul McCartney came to record vocals on Steve Martin's album on a song, which of course became the single as Paul predicted, and the album won a Grammy. I had a great time with Jimmy Fallon when he recorded a duet with Dolly Parton. I've worked with a lot of brilliant local musicians. But mixing is where all the years of experience add up. If recording is the heart of the project, mixing is the soul. Creating spaces and balances between instruments is a refined process where the essence of an artist or song is captured for that moment. I use many tools like equalization, compression, reverbs, delays, 
my cat Zoe, but I use my ears most of all. I listen to other recordings sometimes for reference. I use all my senses. There's no right way to mix, especially these days, when a sonic landscape is as different as there are styles of music, but a mix, like a painting, can be a success or a failure. This is Monk Music Studios, my temple, and I am a monk. I give my complete attention to my work, and it is both a career and a constant meditation on what I love most, and I get to do it here on the East End. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cynthia. I, we had no idea that that was here. <laughs> and we're so glad that you do it here and you do it so well. Uh, our next artist is Scott McIntyre. Born and raised in fertile Willamette Valley in Oregon, Scott McIntyre moved to Portland, Oregon and began a parallel career as an advertising art director as well as a fine artist, showing in regional galleries at, and the Portland Art Museum. His paintings of exotic flora and posters for events and organizations have been shown across the country in Seattle, Denver, San Francisco, Cleveland, New York, and of course, Long Island. McIntyre currently resides in Greenport, Long Island. Come on, come on up. Scott, there you are. Thank you, and thank you to the parish. Uh, my work generally revolves around things that I see in my environment. And in about 2008, I started, I was doing realism before that, just pretty much straight realism, and I wanted to do something more. And uh, the first painting I'll start off with uh, is going to show you where I started the departure. It's, it's the original part of my series that I'm working on now called Energy Field Paintings. And this is of the uh, water mill, uh, windmill, and this is called the Delusion of Quixote in Water Mill. And I started thinking about the psychosis that he was going through as he was battling this uh, windmill. And that started me thinking about types of energy that surround objects that we see. This one is called Considering Global Warming. Because I'm involved with the environment, I'm also involved with the issues that are surrounding the environment. Uh, this one, uh, I, I had to put in these circles to start talking about the tension that was going on in the environment these days. This is a friend's house in Beckett, uh, Massachusetts, sunrise, but as I was there, I was thinking about the aurora borealis and the type of energy that it's, that undergoes, the sky undergoes, similar thing in this one called Road Trip One. Dealing with the unseen energy that surrounds us, and that's become a major element in my work uh, since then. This was done probably around 2011. Uh, the Dance of the Saguaros uh, from a trip to Arizona. I could not get away from the presence of the saguaro cactus and how they uh, dominate the landscape. And there, there's something real about them, something personal about them. Uh, this one is called Fear of Fracking. This was a tree in Mattituck that has since been destroyed from the hurricanes. I know there's no fracking on Long Island, but I wanted to deal with that subject matter. This also brings in some elements of my very early paintings when I was doing op art work. I paint with enamel paint, and this comes from another earlier experiences of mine when I did custom car painting on cars and uh, trucks. And I love the depth and the saturation that I get from this color. This is a sumac energy field. These are roadside uh, weeds that we see. This one's night sky and white barn. Dealing with this new wind turbine that appeared behind this barn, which started this whole series of thinking about uh, doing a black and white painting, playing with the, uh, the energy that surrounds it. 
This particular one is called In Search of Balance. Uh, living on the North Fork, we're dealing with the issues of the deer all the time. In fact, I managed to run into one two weeks ago, uh, literally. Uh, so it's dealing with man trying to deal with this whole environmental issue. Uh, this one was from a rabbit uh, in my uh, backyard, and again, dealing with a fracking issue called the tremors of fracking. And uh, again, going back to the op art that I did early on in my career, this one is called Blues in the Garden. A lot of the elements that I'm picking up now are elements from my backyard. I started in 2013 a photo documentary of all of the birds, insects, and mammals in my yard. And these are from the resource photos that I took from that. This is called Day and Night Cardinal. And uh, I wanted to do a black and white, or black and red painting. And that's how this one started. The uh, energy signature that you see up in the upper uh, left corner is the uh, sound signature from the Cardinal. This is called Midnight Mantis. And again, I'm always looking for different ways to talk about the energy fields that surround us. The color bars that are in the upper left corner, I started thinking about networking and the way the cloud is recording all of the information that we have. This is uh, life and death and the space in between. And to further emphasize ideas about the cloud and how level all of our memories are being stored there, all of our information. That's what the uh, color shape is that's uh, multicolor floating in the sky. Uh, Rose of Sharon with yellow jackets again comes out of my backyard. A lot of uh, talk and noise and stuff going on when they're around. And playing again with the uh, rainbow effect for all energy that comes into this painting called Energy Field One, dealing again with man-made sources of energy and also the, uh, the energy that's found in nature that pulls in all of the insects, uh, which I'm found that flowers, vib when they sense the vibration from insects, start putting out more uh, energy in terms of odors and so on. This is called collision. This deals with the fact that birds are uh, hitting the uh, skyscrapers, especially around New York City, especially around Central Park. Uh, this is a new series I've been working on. This is called The Last uh, Iceberg. And uh, it's sort of quite self-explanatory dealing with the uh, melting of the icebergs. This is the first of the series. The second of the series is the uh, next painting called The Last Encore, showing an iceberg that's more in the state of melting. I also, the, uh, it's interesting, the black in this particular painting is uh, the world's blackest black, so it has a tremendous amount of depth to it. Not the one that Anish Kapoor uses, but a new one that's been developed. Uh, this is a current piece that I just finished, it's 120 days of global warming, starting from 1901 uh, going to 2020. You, it's, it's the most graphic way I could possibly show the change of color. Each stripe represents a year uh, and the uh, average temperature of the globe at that time. So that's it, thank you. Thank you, Scott. I will never look at some of those animals and plants and flora the same way. Seeing them through your eyes is just incredible. And to know that those are things that you're looking at in your backyard and on the road in our beautiful towns here uh, makes it all the more special. Our next artist is Meloria Griffiths. Uh, Meloria is a multidisciplinary artist with a through line focusing on painting. She attended Rhode Island School of Design, the Santa Monica College of Design, Art, and Architecture, holds an MFA from Vermont College of Fine Arts, and is a graduate of the Neighborhood Playhouse School of Theater. 
Melanie was born in New York City and currently works there in shelter, and works here in Shelter Island. Her work has been exhibited nationally on the East End, New York City, Vermont, Rhode Island, Colorado, and California. Welcome, Melan. Melora. Thank you. Yes, my name is Melora. <laughs> um, Melora Griffiths. Okay, so here we go. A sunset, a performance, making a painting and life itself occur over time and are subject to changes. Like a scientist seeking an antidote, I live creatively. What is broken can be beautiful and bring us together. Dark clouds loom as we raise cell phones up like torches, shields, or mirrors to a sky that cannot be measured. Confronting shadow, a quieter clarity is found. Moonlight casts sensual reflection on wet skin. The inky night water is illuminated with the stroke of white paint. Living in a theater until the age of nine, I was exposed to an environment governed by the import of the imaginary. I learned to see without looking, to sense. The premise of existence was predicated on a zeal to believe. A character's emotional life and story is revealed through voice, movement, prop, costume, hair, and makeup. I reference the same eclectic strategy when making a painting. A theater in the round approach invites an interdisciplinary response using repetition to meditate on a subject. I gravitate toward tragic comic elegant irony that suggests inquiry. I might look like a woman giving a lecture behind a podium and become a woman who wraps the lectern in muslin transforming the hard square shape into a soft bundle. The body is like a bundle, especially when in bed, wrapped in sheet and blanket. A train wreck is a euphemism for things gone off the rails. The police hold up a sheet that I have stuffed and sewn to the painting, creating a sculptural element to the otherwise two-dimensional surface. My grandmother made clothes for herself, my mother, me, and my doll. I learned to sew. The, the fabric of life is a mysterious weave, and its stages intricate. Societal implications suggest doubt. A person's inherent home is their physical body. I stand in a vintage nightgown bought at the Vidya Granier, a garage sale in France literally translated, out of the attic. This self-portrait is a vertical triptych with three panels sewn together across my lips and ankles. Wisdom comes with age. There is more space below the roof where doors open and close. No longer upstage, I have a voice and walk with autonomy. The baby carriage needs to be pushed. It cannot move without assistance. Paper is less precious ground that, than canvas for working with profundity. Drawing is emphasized and clarity comes quickly. I am drawn to the vehicle, a solid hard container that holds a soft fragile body and can take it somewhere. Behind the wheel, foot on the pedal, hand on the throttle, speed is optional and powered by the driver. The road is my home. I make a continuous line without looking down. Contour drawing was the lost language I had been looking for. I made a series of cave paintings with por portals where light comes in, intrigued with an edge and corner free place. They were nest shaped like our first home in a worm sack. Coincidentally, I was simultaneously asked to work on a dance piece titled The Forms Things Take that explored the relationship of the surface of the skin with the external world, inner and outer fluids, spirals, and wrapping. I made his and hers grief caves. Sewing became a titration technique, tilling the ground before the celebratory paint and glitter enter. Found fabric is stitched to muslin with different colored threads. The topographical mass invokes repair, grief, becomes exquisite and precious. Yoga shorts transform, transform into red carpets. I make a fleet of 10 jets, all named after places a successful businessman travels to. 
I write a story about a woman in waiting and tell it in a series of paintings. In the center of the larger mouth is an image of a smaller one. The artist's lips sever the divide between two sides of a mythical body of water. Helicopters, planes, bikes, cars, and scooters are drawn to the center made of fur, feathers, bathing caps, real gray hair, silk, leather, plastic rhinestones, and more. The painting is called Prayer Sea. In the oil painting, the party's over. She holds her device but gazes away from it at us. Humanity has delivered an invitation to examine the quality of our collective condition as well as our individual one. My work is personal. As a result of this self-reflection, it enters into a dialogue with a broader social conscience. There is no end to the spectrum of color and skin when painting a portrait. The essence of the human spirit is all dressed up, asking the question where she will go. In quarantine, I made 18 sewn works. This is the lost picnic. Peace bridge tickets come in a book with a perforated edge. The customs agent tears one out and she gives the other uh, the officer her full attention as the script is delivered. Citizenship? Anything to declare? If they believe her answers are true, she is free to enter the country. The beauty of the bridge is the view of the water below and the arc of the drive over it. Looking back and in, she recognizes fragments of herself essential to the whole. Traversing the depths, she rescues the abandoned. Shame drained. A sovereign citizen exists. I felt safe making marks. I could lose myself in the process. I would like to thank the parish for providing a container that supports and engages with an established artistic community of which I am grateful to be a part of. Incredible. And we're so grateful for you. The storytelling aspect of that was just really incredible. Um, our next artist is David Rankin. David is British-born, Australian, and New York-based artist. He has exhibited globally, including New York, London, Paris, Berlin, and Beijing, in over 100 exhibitions. His work has been celebrated internationally and is held in the collections of the Australian National Gallery in Canberra, the National Gallery of Victoria in Melbourne, and the Art Gallery of South Australia in Adelaide, among others. I want to welcome David up to the podium. Thank you. Uh, that was... Uh... It's been a wonderful night so far. I've, I've, I've enjoyed it so much. Uh, there's so much challenging work. Um, I didn't go to a celebrated university or art school. I grew up in outback Australia. My dad uh, was an alcoholic boot repairer and boxer. Uh, my mum was 16 when I was born. So I grew up not having ever really seen a university or art school, but I knew from a very gifted teacher I had when I was in primary school, he said, Rankin, you draw very well, you should read this book. And it was a book of drawings by Leonardo da Vinci. So for the next 10 years, I painted lots and lots of profiles of men who looked, old men who looked very Italian. <laughs> as I've grown, uh, I grew up, in, as I said, in the outback, I realized that the Australian landscape was going to be something profoundly important to me. But as also was the fact that we were in Australia. We were grafted into Australia. And we were in the Orient. We were in Asia. So I grew to love great Asian art, great Chinese, Japanese painting and philosophy, uh, Buddhist art and the art of the Australian Aborigines. So they're the elements that have been part of my life. But thankfully, since then, I've managed to you know, travel the world. I've worked in, in, in Europe. I've worked in Jerusalem. I've worked in Beijing. This first painting uh, is from the early 1970s, a summer walk. It's a very animistic 
uh, landscape. This one, Wu Jiapo, Lady Precious Stream, like an animistic uh, image of, anima of, of a spiritual passage. I used a lot of images and formats of Chinese and Japanese art. So I used this image of the, the, the format of a hanging scroll. Um, so I would be able to use give it both a sense of, of a human form and proportion or almost like a doorway. This one uh, based on a hillside and a gully. So these paintings have all been from the early 1970s where I was in my 20s and exploring the kind of animistic landscapes, the Taoistic landscapes in my mind. Later on, uh, this next group of paintings are uh, called Prophecy of Dry Bones and not this particular one, but the next... Oh, does that work now? Yeah. The next group of two paintings are called Prophecy of Dry Bones. And I did them in Mexico in, on a dusty, dry hillside in Guanajuato. And I was painting on the ground and I was, there were dogs and chickens and dust everywhere. And as I was working, and I was working on the, the painting, I looked up and there was a group of Chichimeca Indian guys standing around me. And as I was painting, they looked at me and one of the guys went like this, delineating his ribs. And I, that was an, a, a totally uh, revelatory moment for me because I realised that what we are doing as artists is it, eternal and universal. And what is profoundly you know, personal to me is universal and these people had no problem understanding. This is a, a series called Bending Buddha. Lily looked at one of my drawings, my wife Lily Brett looked at one of my drawings one day and said, oh, I love that, it looks like Buddha bending. I thought, I thought more phases of the moon. And Lily said, oh no, it's his bald head as he bends. <laughs> so it became forever known as Buddha bending. The next paintings are a series that I started when I was working through uh, the early days of the pandemic and I, oh, sorry, these ones are called Mungo Landscape and they're almost like aerial Chinese landscapes looking down over the landscape with a bird's eye perspective following the contours, the scrub and the, the and Mungo is a dry lake bed area in Australia that is now dry but has very, you know, the remains of, of 60,000 year old Aboriginal culture in the middens, they are excavating now the great the charcoal and the food remains when it was an abundant lake area. So it's a very fertile area for me. And this, the next one is Mungo with red clouds because I was thinking about China and red dragons as well because in the early days of Mungo, there were communities of Chinese workers who lived there in, in that dry landscape building some of the local properties. And the last, the next group is a series called Uplift. And I'd started working on these almost like aspirational images in the early days of, of the pandemic when, uh, when I wanted something that would, would give me some sense of aspiration, something to drag, to climb out of this dark and di difficult time. So they, bec they became very, very aspirational images for me. The next images um, 
that I've, I've got here are two liminal landscapes. These are the most recent paintings where I'm using um, a sense of heightened sensibility and a liminal landscape, a, a liminal space is that space between where we are now and where we may be. It's that space in between. So these two paintings are called liminal landscapes. And the last two paintings that I've got are two paintings that are quite recent and they're, again, using that Asian, Chinese, Japanese hanging scroll format. And these are called wandering loans. Loans are like Buddhist, uh, Buddha's disciples, Buddha's followers. So these are two paintings based on the image of two loans in a landscape. So thank you. We almost got through the whole night without technical difficulties. I'm sorry for that, David. Um, you, did, you handled that really well. And um, I think almost every artist has mentioned the pandemic right now. And it's just um, a reminder that we are still in that liminal space, I believe, between what was and what is to come. We're still wearing masks. Um, this is very much part of our day, and you can tell that it is part of your art and the work that you all do on a regular basis. Um, Lorena Salcedo Watson is our eighth artist for Pecha Kucha Night. Very happy to have um, Lorena here. Uh, she is an artist and a printmaker whose imagery reveals a fascination with anatomy, botany, and entomology as uh, she interprets life and nature filtered through personal experience, observation, and imagination. Her background as a collective printmaker at ULAE, a renowned Long Island printmaking shop, workshop inspired her teaching at Cooper Union. Stony Brook University, and her role in helping to establish the nonprofit community oriented studio at Gallery North in Setauket. Welcome, Lorena. There you are. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everyone who came out. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I want to thank the Parish Museum and Olivia and Victor and everybody that had a wonderful role in helping to bring us here. And it was wonderful meeting a lot of my fellow artists. So thank you for this evening. Um, I really appreciate, I'm excited to be here. I'm, I really appreciate the opportunity to show my work and to share a little bit about myself. My family came to New York from Guatemala when I was four. My childhood consisted of trying to assimilate. Without relatives in this country, my nuclear family was my bubble. From Astoria, we moved to East Patrog. In Belport High School, I had a wonderful mentor who encouraged me to pursue art. I attended Cooper Union and fell in love with printmaking. I worked as a professional printmaker, collaborating with artists on their own projects. I loved it. When interviewing for the job, I was reminded that there would be one artist in the room and it would not be me. I was the collaborator, the tool, the set of hands that would help others to create. While working, I married and had a family. I was invited to speak at Cooper Union about my print collaborations and was subsequently invited to teach there. I had stopped making my own artwork while working as a printer. Teaching pushed me to find my work again. I needed to develop images to demonstrate different techniques. In order to create, despite feeling rusty, I had to be willing to be vulnerable and to step beyond my ego in order to have something to share with my students. My artwork stems from my curiosity. 
my need to see everything closely. I have always collected remnants of nature, including insects, skeletons of small animals, and sea creatures, seed pods, and more. Over the years, my cabinet of curiosities has become a glossary to my work. Childbirth. My first daughter was in a breech position before she was delivered. An x-ray was taken to determine if a C-section would be necessary. She was a perfect little creature inside my pelvis, like an insect suspended in amber. To me, it was the most spectacular image ever captured. After I had three more daughters, I was ready to translate that experience. Pursuing my MFA with studio space, I was ready to focus on my own work. The magnitude of the experiences I wanted to describe led me to work larger than life. Parenting could be heavy physical and emotional work. At times, I felt like I was giving all of myself completely, like being flayed. That vulnerability taught me resilience. A herniated disc made me aware of my spine and sacrum. I envisioned neural wiring and projecting paths of pain. With pinched nerves, knee and shoulder injuries, I regularly visualized my internal landscape. I found my imagery in observing nature, growth, and transformations in living forms and in my own metamorphosis. I looked to nature in search of spaces, textures, and forms that evoke emotion and invite interpretations and associations. I often pull realism toward abstraction to give the viewer a point of entry. In translating my observations of nature and physical experiences, I want to give the viewer a ride, an opportunity to find a connection to their own awareness and experiences. Throughout my college teaching between semesters, I have been involved with art programs for young children. I often share my collections with them, inviting them to look closely. It doesn't sound silly to them when I encourage them to find what is magical in the familiar yet extraordinary world around us. I'm always reassured when they're as excited as I am. Their pure sense of curiosity is the special trust that I honor. Teaching, sharing, and creating with others centers me. My drawings interpret bodily experience in a language of tissue and bone. Like a palimpsest with deep scars and erasures, they document a physical history. Working in charcoal, I create surfaces and textures with line and tone, smearing and erasing as forms emerge and evolve. Continual changes are integral to the process of developing the image. The distressed paper surface is often analogous to the corporeal experience being evoked. I often find familiar structures and patterns in my imagery and welcome their interconnections. My spine can easily morph into that of a fish or moth. My torso is sometimes the thorax of an insect. I can sprout wings and become a vast network of nerves that merge with the skeleton of a flower. In 2014, I suddenly lost my mother to a botched, unnecessary surgical test. I had just had rotator cuff surgery. I desperately needed to draw and grieve in the darkness of my charcoal. My right arm was useless. I drew bones daily from my collection with my left hand. I felt suspended over a chasm in my grief. In 2019, I faced helping my father as he was dying. The gravity of the emotion permeated my body. I needed to process it to move beyond it when he passed. I was learning how to put the grief somewhere. I needed to put it down so I could stop carrying it around. Confined by the pandemic, my drawings referenced feelings of uncertainty, isolation, fear, and caution. Human potential is analogous to seed pods floating in space, awaiting germination. The negative space, 
like a solarized photograph, evokes the surreal nature of this time. Connecting with life and nature inspires wonder. It keeps us receptive and sensitive in caring for others and our environment. Art creates a space for curiosity and trust in expressing ideas. In creating, we welcome others into our world. In sharing ourselves, we invite others to connect with their own magic and resilience. Thank you. Thank you so much. were for you that look into the body and into some of those hard times. Wow, this is my first Pecha Kucha night um, here. And so, and it was, okay. But I say that, I say that because I, I think, you know, you're literally transformed when you see so much art in such a short amount of time and done so well. Um, I don't know how many times you've had to put together those kinds of, uh, PowerPoints and um, storytelling with it. Uh, it was just, it was completely um, amazing. And uh, I wanna thank you all for being here. That was our eighth presenter. Uh, they were fantastic. I have to make uh, some thank yous, but before I do that, I want to, um, well, I wanna thank everybody here um, who has come, but our members, our members are important. Um, parts of our, our museum here, and I am the director of membership, so it's important for me to say to you that we appreciate you. We know that your membership is for multiple different reasons, and I'm just very happy that you come and attend these programs and that you spread the word uh, about the museum and all the wonderful programs that we have. Um, and if you're new here for your first time, welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, Thursday, some upcoming programs I want to share with you. Thursday, October 7th, we have a talk on Roy Lichtenstein called uh, Look Nikki with our Lewis B. and Dorothy Coleman, Chief Curator and Art, Educa Art, Art, uh, Art of Art and Education. Um, and we have on Friday, October 8th, a talk with roadshow artist Darlene Cherneko and Senior Curator of Arts Reach and Special Projects, uh, Corinne Ernie. Um, and on October 11th, 17th, and 23rd, we have welcome days here that we just put on the calendar for the Parish um, Museum. We are going to have free admission, and we're creating more opportunities for the community to, for community members to engage with our exhibition, Tamashi Jackson's The Land Claim. And if you had any opportunity to walk through the museum tonight, you would have seen it. And if you haven't, please go. There's still time. The museum is open. So we will have a few days where we are inviting um, the community, uh, local residents who don't ordinarily come to be able to come into the museum. On October 18th, from 11 to 1, we have a new member uh, welcome reception. So if you happen to be a new member or um, want to become a new member on October 18th, we'll have a reception. We're gonna tell you a little bit more about the things that are happening here. And um, I think that wraps up most of the evening, but I wanna say the thank you. So I invite my colleague, Chrissy, who greeted you at the front desk to come up here. She's gonna help me with my thank yous. There was no way to sneak this in, <laughs> um, but I really want to invite Olivia to come up. Olivia, please come up. <laughs> Olivia did an amazing job. She and I are both new here at the parish, and she worked with all of the artists, uh, put together the order of the evening, which just, wow, brought us through a journey, and just, I don't know what else to say. Thank you, thank you. And Victor, Victor's in the booth. Oh, he's not in the booth anymore. He's down here and he does such a great job with our uh, technology. And Eric Casey was here too. Um, and I guess that's it. That wraps it up for the evening. Thank you so much.